Good morning and welcome everyone. We are studying the book of Romans. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I intended to just do chapter 3, but then as I read over it and over it uh, throughout a week of time, I thought we better start at chapter 1 and just go through. And so we, last week we went through Romans 1, 1 through 17 where Paul said to all the saints, and we studied that the word saint is the first word of Holy Spirit. Saint is the same Greek word as holy and Holy Spirit. It means set apart. We are set apart for the Lord. We belong to him, and we are holy because of who's in us. I am holy because the Holy One is in me. I am righteous because the Righteous One is in me. I am dead, and my life is hid with Christ in God, buried with Christ, and baptism raised by the faith of the operation of God. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the same with you. If you are a saint, and if you have received Christ, you are a saint. And he goes on to establish that the grace of God, that salvation by faith is for Jew and for Gentile. Now, Paul is going to continue like, a, like an attorney. He's going to corner everybody. He starts at Romans 1, and he is going to show that salvation is not just for Jew, but for Jew, Gentile, for the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to keep that in mind. When we start at verse 18, it's going to seem, and people will try to say, God is a wrathful God. He is mean. He hates this kind of person. He, hates. he doesn't hate anybody. He loves everybody. He loves the prostitute. He loves the adulterer. He loves the homosexual. He loves the drug addict. He loves the alcoholic. And he reaches out. But when people constantly are haters of God, I don't want you. I hate you. God steps back. As you see, he'll turn over. He'll step back again and turn over. Now, watch what happens in this case. Because today, after talking about all of us who are saints, he's going to go on to show what happens in a world where people absolutely hate God, they reject God, and they are the perpetrators of this enmity, not God. And so we'll look into that today. But let's bow our heads and pray before we actually go into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank and praise you so much for who you are. We are all enemies of God and all subject to wrath. Because of our enmity against you, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth right, no, not one. And yet, in a lost world, when one had to give a life and none of us had one, we were all spiritually dead. You were the only one who had a life. But a man had to die, so you stepped down and became a man and took all the sins of the world from Adam to the last person on earth and took them completely away at the cross of Calvary. So there's nothing between man and God. So no one can say I'm separated by my sins. The barrier has been removed and you said, let me come live in you. And when I come live in you, you've already passed from death to life. But the world as a whole has said, no, we choose not to believe in you. We choose to hate you. We choose to reject you. Open up our eyes as we look into the word today, Lord. And if any have rejected you, may they come to the place to confess that they are a sinner, that they are lost, that they are spiritually dead, and that they need a Savior it's that easy. Believe on him whom the Father has sent, and you shall have eternal life. Lord, open up our minds and open up our hearts to receive the word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, so the thought of our message today, we're going through Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. The picture I have on the screen is of a baby and of Jesus who is... Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it on the screen. The picture I'm going to have on the screen I wonder why nobody was appreciating the picture. There you go. <laughs> the picture is of a baby and of Jesus who is the light of the world. 
Now, everybody probably knows 1 John 1, 9, right? I want everybody to know John 1, 9. Get rid of the first. John 1, 9 says that Jesus is the light who lights every person who enters the world. Keep that in mind. See the baby looking up at Jesus the light? Every human who enters this world receives light from Jesus. Everybody has light. So remember that when people plead ignorance. And we're, Paul is going to establish this case. So, as I said, I have a lot of commentaries. I have Donald Gray Barnhouse taught at 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia, world famous. He has four books on the Book of Romans. He taught it for like 38 years. Wonderful series, very deep. I have James Montgomery Boyce and others, but this is Michael Pearl, and I'm going to quote at times. I'm not going to see him saying Michael Pearl said this. I have mixtures and paraphrases of his, but also what the Lord has shown me. I'm just saying that so nobody says that you're plagiarizing. I'm not plagiarizing, I'm letting you know that some of the words will be his. But commentaries can be very helpful because we all add God gives everybody light. So we receive light from others just as a body of Christ and then God gives us light also. But let's start at verse 18. It seems like a little bit of a twist after ending with, for the just shall live by faith is what we ended with last week. Now that's a, a quote from Habakkuk 2.4 and it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Romans, the just shall live by faith. Galatians, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews, the just shall live by faith. With emphasis on a different word in each, but I'm not going to that right now for time's sake. But here's what Paul is turning to now. After saying this salvation is for everybody, he goes on to say, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word, the Greek word for hold is used 19 times in the New Testament, and it is always in the sense of possessing or holding. The NIV is the only version who takes it this one time, 18 times it translates it the same, and this one instance it says to to, uh, re to suppress or to hold back. That's not what it means. They're changing the meaning of, of all how it's used the other 18 times. It means you actually have, you actually hold a knowledge of the truth. And we know that because as we showed in John 9, 1-9, uh, Jesus lightens everyone who comes into the world. So we all have a knowledge of truth. Now, let's go on and look into this. So, people hold the truth in unrighteousness, and we are responsible for the truth because all men know the truth. There are no excuses, and so the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against whom? Those who know it and reject it. Now, suppose a person is a baby and he doesn't really have understanding yet. Is he responsible? No. Suppose a person is mentally challenged and doesn't have the fa faculties to understand the truth of God. Would God hold them accountable? I'm not saying they're saved. I'm saying that the wrath of God is against people knowing that he exists and deliberately choosing to reject him. And that's what he's going to establish here. So Paul continues his argument that he started in verse 16. If the wrath of God comes upon all without distinction, Jew and Gentile, then salvation is to all by grace through faith. Because Paul's talking to Jews and Gentiles in Rome. And the Jews are the ones that are saying, hey, they, these people can't have our God. They can't have the salvation. And Paul is showing that the gospel is for everybody, that Jesus died for everybody. And that's what he's trying to establish. It's by grace through faith to all. If the wrath is to all, then the salvation is to all. There has to be a way, he's saying to these Jews, to satisfy the righteousness of God, and it's never been satisfied by the law because no one has ever kept the law. 
There is a righteousness that satisfies God, and that is the righteousness of Jesus Christ received by faith, and that satisfies, and that only, alone satisfies. Now, the wrath of God, let's look at that. God's wrath is more than just anger. We think of anger as wrath. It's the rightful response of the chief justice of the universe against the rebellion and wickedness of his created beings. Think about it. God creates us. He creates our planet. He creates everything. And then we tell him he doesn't have a right to govern us. He doesn't have a right to make the rules. I decide who God is. I decide what God is like. What I believe is my truth, and you have no right in my life. Think about how unreasonable that is to tell the Creator, get out of my life, get away from me. Because that's exactly what the majority of the world does. And that's what I did, unwittingly at times, but we don't realize our self-righteousness and not accepting the righteousness of Christ through grace, by faith. So just think the chief justice of the universe has to have wrath upon the rebellion and wickedness of his created beings. Now God's, I'm sorry, let me go. Wrath from heaven, he says, is from heaven, which is the very seat of the ultimate government. This is the top. When people talk about the Supreme Court said, I thought it might be right and it might be wrong. But here's the real Supreme Court. Supreme, the top, the superlative is the throne of God. Whatever man decides, Whatever they gather together and decide, if it's against what God says, it's nothing. Now, I obey the law, but if it goes against what God says, I already know who is. You say, well, this is the Supreme Court. said, well, I say, well, here's the real Supreme Court, and he says otherwise. This is the ultimate authority, the throne of God, who is the chief justice and the king of the universe. The offense is serious. This wrath implies that men are to blame. And that is because of personal ungodliness and unrighteousness. It's not that I'm, I'm a victim, you know, I, I, was, I, I inherited this and, and therefore I'm a victim. We all know. No person can say, I've always obeyed my conscience and what I know of God. Not a heathen, not a tribal person, not a person on an island. Why is it they all have sacrificial systems? Why is it that Mayans and everybody are offering sacrifices because they all know that they have a blame for what they have done? This is inherent in humans. Now, let's go to look. Mankind created in God's image. Mankind was created in God's image, has the potential to be godly, but chooses otherwise. Ungodliness is man's fault, not his misfortune. It's not a misfortune, oh yeah, I'm ungodly, but it's no fault of mine. That's what most people want to claim. I'm not responsible. My dad and my mom, or my this, my... I had a, a, a person I used to work with, and he had to be 45 or 50 at the time. He said, you know, I, I just borrowed 20000 I have a big family. I know I shouldn't. Have, I bought a toolbox. But you know, my mom and dad, they always went in debt, and, and they always did this. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, you're a grown man. Don't tell me mom and dad. This is not mom and dad's fault. You know you're supposed to pay your bills. What are you buying a $20,000 tool chest for with all the tools in it? That's not daddy's fault. That's not my fault. That's your fault. I'd say that. That would be real popular But because he was older than I was. But the thing is, we don't want to take any responsibility as humans. We want to say that I'm just a victim of society. And I'm poor me. But we are responsible. Now... The wrath of God is against those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. To hold the truth in unrighteousness is to know God. Verse 21, as we're going to see, says, When they knew God, they did not know Him intimately, but with sufficient understanding to be responsible. Now, when we say people know God, it doesn't mean they have a personal relationship. It doesn't mean they're saved. It doesn't mean they know Him in forgiveness. It means they know sufficiently there's a God, they know that he's eternal, they know that he's omnipotent, they know if he's a God, he's without beginning, without end, they know if he's God, 
that all the power, he has to be greater than the sum total of all powers, otherwise he couldn't have created them. So they know these things about God. And how is it that every civilization has certain understanding that murder is wrong and stealing is wrong? N nobody even had a printed law. It's just that, see, God inherently put a lot of this knowledge into us. So that's why we are responsible. And when people say, oh, they never heard the gospel, they could have. They know God. And let's go on and we're going to, Paul will establish that further. All have sinned and are unrighteous. Paul is going to prove, and, and the reason I printed a lot of this out is it makes it easier for translating too because I can spend the time put it in English and Portuguese. So it's, it's good to have it printed. Paul is going to prove that all are under sin when we get to chapter 3. We all have had guilt, which is self-blame because we cannot excuse ourselves. Everybody has self-blame. You cannot tell me that you never felt guilt or self-blame. Even before you came to know the Lord, you still felt guilt and self-blame. Once a man becomes aware of the truth, he can never become unaware of the truth. So if God has made himself known, maybe not personally, but everywhere you look, it screams God. It screams the Creator. But he can choose not to retain God in his knowledge. Now, you can't become unaware of truth, but you can choose not to retain him in your knowledge. Push him back to the inner recesses of the mind. He can change God's image in his own mind into an image of an idol, but he will still be held responsible for the truth he has pushed to, those back, to the back of his mind, to the inner recesses. God still says you're responsible. You are holding the truth. You are choosing not to retain me in your knowledge. You are choosing to reject me. I will not, as Jesus used in the parable, we will not have this man to rule over us. That was one of the parables he used. Now, let's go to verse 19. Because that which may be known of God, everything that may be known of God, is manifest in them. Manifest means made clear. For God has showed it unto them. God has shown every human, every person that enters the world receives light that there is a creator. It's inborn, it's innate, in other words, and everywhere you look. When you see a baby being born, people are in awe. This is a miracle. Yeah, it's beyond humans, right? When you see a mountain, when you see a tree, a tree. You look at the majesty and you think, this is not random chemical motion. The detail, the complexity. When you see the human eye, a million optic nerves when you're in the womb, lead brain, a million lead the eyeball. They come towards each other and they find their exact match or you can't see. One million to one million, what are the odds that they find their exact match? And you say that's random? No. See, you cannot deny this. To deny that is a choice of total ignorance. The wrath of God is revealed against those who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God will vary from person to person. So you can't say we all have exactly the same knowledge, but God makes himself clear through creation, through the visible universe, even the things that we don't see. And by culture, somebody in South America might have a little different knowledge than I do, but nevertheless it's there. Somebody in China has that knowledge. But we all have it. Regardless of whether we've heard the gospel or not, we have this innate knowledge. Yet the knowledge of him is in them. It is in every person. No man with his full mental abilities is without this knowledge, for God has showed it unto them. Paul is building his case. As I said, as an attorney, he is building the case. This knowledge is in everybody, and you are without excuse. Now, God has shown it. This is why God has shown it. John 1, 9. That was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. The Spirit of God is active. 
You might not be active on the streets, but the Spirit of God is active in every hospital, in every home, in every business place, on every street. The Spirit of God is active, revealing to every man all that he is capable of understanding. Now, granted, you can go a lot further. After receiving this general revelation, you can go to the scriptures and receive specific revelation, and that's what God intends. But if you push off the general revelation, that's where we start this enmity against God. God has shown it. This knowledge is not learned through reading the Bible or investigating science, but is an inner witness based on the outward observation of nature. It's undeniable. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth his handiwork. They scream out Jesus. If you look at the heavens and say there's no God somehow, these things popped up there. That's a huge problem. That's a choice. That is not ignorance. That is a choice. If I told you that this Apple Watch, if you said where did that come from? I said, you know, I had this bag of dirt and stuff and I left it in the closet for like seven years and this watch formed. It's random motion. You say, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Do you know how much design is in there? Do you know this wrist is probably a million times more complex than this watch? Do you know the nerves in here that are electrically charged and the battery is charged by my eating food and goes from as a chemical conversion to form electricity for all the wires in my body, millions and billions of them? And the cell, the complexity is unbelievable. The amount of joints in here to have this kind of dexterity is beyond human comprehension. Get them to try to duplicate this with a machine. Oh, it's really difficult. Yeah, it is. And you, well, it shouldn't be because it happened. It came out of dirt. You said it was random, so if you're so bright and you're in a lab and all you guys put your other wisdom together, you should be able to duplicate this if there's no God. See, it's a choice. Verse 20, for the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Is that, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. The invisible things of God. Well, I've, I've never seen God. Okay, you know what? I've never seen the guy that built this building or the guys that built it in 1914. Most likely they're all dead. But I can tell you they exist. And I can tell you they were pretty bright. As I go through this building and look at the heavy slate roof and the, the big beams they all calculated to hold this building up, I don't have to see them to know that somebody had a design and it was pretty brilliant. Well, I don't have to see God with my natural eyes to know that he's a wonderful, all-powerful, creative God. Amen? I can see what he has done. I see what he does in my life. I don't hear his physical. People say, you are saying you heard God? I say, absolutely. With your ear? No. Clearer than my ear. You, when you speak to me, it's clear. When he speaks to me, it's beyond audible hearing. It is, a, it is real. So the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, what? Being understood, understood by the things that are made. I understand it by the things that are made. I understand his power and his majesty and his love and his mercy because it's still going on despite all that we do and have done. It's still going on and he still loves me. So I see a lot about God from what I view and people and plants and animals and planets and stars and mountains and oceans and waterfalls, the grandeur and the glory, I see it. And the things that I witness, and it is clearly, I clearly understand. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I've heard Christians try to say, well, you can't really blame them. They've never heard the gospel. Paul is saying, that is no excuse. There's so much evidence of God to reject him, and to make an idol is inexcusable. And it is inexcusable. Now let's go on. So even all heathens know God. 
Any knowledge anyone has of God must come as he reveals himself. Remember, the Holy Spirit is, with, is at, busy at work throughout the planet. God loves everyone and he works with everyone. It comes to a choice. Will you choose to reject him or will you choose to accept him? It's not choose to, to earn, to work out your way, to try harder. He's telling you it's free, it's available in an instant. All you have to do is believe on him whom he has sent. And believe doesn't miss me. Yeah, I believe there's a Jesus. It means to trust in, to realize there is nothing good in me. I will never be righteous. I will never satisfy the righteousness of God. But I have a free gift that I can receive, Jesus Christ in me, and I am saved eternally. There is no excuse. It's not that I'm physically disabled. I, I you know, it's hard for me to, it's, he didn't ask me to do anything but to receive. That makes everybody inexcusable. I offered, you rejected, period. But he still tries, and he tries, and he tries, and he tries. To an extent, and let's see, let's continue. Without excuse, so this revelation seen in nature eliminates all claims of ignorance. The degree of this knowledge does not compare with the knowledge available through Scripture, but it is sufficient to make man responsible. According to the truth man has seen and yet disobeyed, he is without excuse. Do you see that? So, you know, I, I was teaching form class indoors the other day, and we were going into the math, figuring out how much feed each animal eats each day, we had to put it in cups and weigh the cup and then see how many pounds was in a bag and determine how many days it would last. Well, I had third graders and I had fifth graders and I had seventh grader. And so I would ask them to come to the board and some of it was division and we were doing fractions. And so a couple of third graders said, and I thought, I don't expect you to know this because you're third graders. Can you do the subtraction? Yes. So see, that's where you are. You do subtraction. You older guys, I expect you to do multiplication and division. So when he says, the degree of this knowledge does not compare, according to the truth, man has seen and yet disobeyed, he is without excuse. Does that make sense? So, so we have received a lot from God, right? Some people haven't received, but we have received Christ. But imagine people who have heard it and it's been explained and they've been around it, and they still reject the Lord, he's going to say, you know, you're really without excuse because you have really had a lot of knowledge of me, and yet choose not to believe in me, to reject me. So verse 21, because that when they knew God, he's talking to all people, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. He said, nobody can say they didn't know God. He said, when you knew God. And he's talking to the Romans. There's Roman believers whose faith is spoken of throughout the world. And there's Roman unbelievers. And there's Jews there that think we don't really need him because we already have it and Gentiles shouldn't. So they're actually rejecting God. So he's saying, you knew him. But you don't glorify him as God. Oh, we do religious things. That's not, you're not glorifying him as God. You're not thankful. You're vain in your imagination. Now, God has given us imaginations, and it's, it's actually uh, as our Father, as our Creator, in other words, before he becomes our Father, he's given us creative power, and we can look at some of the things people design. They design cars and buildings and gardens, and, and they can imagine a lot of things. Like, I, I, I put a pond in my backyard, and I'll stand there sometimes. I would just be standing out there for hours, and people think, what are you standing at? Because in my mind, I've got something over here and something here, and I'm creating in my mind, and then you take that creation, and you put it into effect, and you start. Well, God has given us that. But when we imagine things that are impossible and things that are ludicrous and ridiculous and wrong, that's a vain imagination. Because sometimes our imaginations go really into things where they shouldn't be and those are vain imaginations 
And he's saying, when you knew God, you didn't glorify him as God. You weren't thankful, but became vain in your imaginations, imagining things not the way God has them, but the way you want the world to be, the way you want the moral law to be. And he says, your foolish heart is talking because of that. You're imagining that all God said is no good, and that in my world, the little Minecraft world that I create, I make it where everybody does what they want, and, and we just uh, we just uh, wallow in, in immorality and everything. It's the way, and in money or whatever it might be, we imagine things that are vain when we don't know the Lord, and we reject Him because His plan, although He's governor king of the universe, that's not the way I want the world. So, man unavoidably knows God. I, I keep repeating that because it's the truth. Unavoidably, every man knows God to an extent. It's not to know him in forgiveness, it's not to know him intimately, but simply to know of his attributes and his glory and his righteousness. They responded by choosing to disregard the truth that's clearly seen they glorified him not as God. Chose. This is a choice. This is a choice. I choose not to give you glory. I choose to disregard the truth that I've come to know. There is no God. And I don't want to hear the name Jesus mentioned in my place of employment because it offends me. I don't want to hear Jesus mentioned in the marketplace or in my country or in the school. This is what they say because, why? Because I've tried to block him out and you keep bringing it back up. And now it's grating on me. In fact, the very way you live is grating on me again. And I want all of that taken away and we'll get to that now. So the first sin listed is not immorality, adultery, homosexuality or anything. First sin listed, and as I said, God loves everybody. So don't say God is a hater. People try to make it appear God is a hater because he don't like this group of people. No, he's not. The group of people often are rejecting God, not God rejecting them. The first sin listed is failure to glorify God. Paul says that's the first sin. It's the greatest of sins because it's the beginning of rebellion against the Lord's authority. When you refuse to glorify him, you are rebelling against him and against his authority. And that is the, that is the door to other sins. That's the door to go to other sins, that rebellion. Now, man is naturally endowed with an inclination to glory and to glorious. So suppose a man for the first time walks up to Niagara Falls and he's like, oh, and, and you worship. It's, when I say worship, it's, it's like you're in awe and you see the grandeur and you're like, now I would definitely be worshiping because it'd be like, God did this. Really, seriously, it's like, I feel so small. Uh, uh, we were up in uh, Watkins Glen uh, when our kids were little uh, camping, and there was waterfalls everywhere. And we went to Tuganic Falls, which is higher than Niagara, 400 and something feet. And we just stood there like, this is, I'll use the term right, awesome. This is glorious. And you stand there and you say, I feel so small. I feel, so, I feel like this is God's work, right? But if you turn your back and, and, and show no appreciation, it would show that you came with a preconceived attitude to reject what others found glorious. And this is what they're doing. As I see this, you just glorify God because I say there has to be a God. Or you can say, no, I, I, I don't want that. I, I want to I forget that. I want to reject that because of all this attached to that. I, I don't want to be sub subject to God. I want to reject that. So no, I will not look at the glory. This came from evolution. This was uh, a bunch of dirt was swinging around. It made a waterfall and all. It just, it just happened. There was some kind of meteor or ice age or something. It had to be something. It doesn't make sense, but I choose to believe it anyway. Like evolution goes contrary to all the laws of science. The second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, is the most provable of all the laws of science. That's what Newton said. It says that everything goes from order to disorder. And evolution goes from disorder to order. From disorder to order, that's exactly backwards. 
against science. You're saying it's science. It's against science. And, and I had people tell me, you guys still believe in God? Carbon dating shows it's so many million years old. And I say, well, honey, I'm, I'm sorry you don't know science then because carbon dating is only good for about seven to 14,000 years. At max 50,000, if something's been underwater, it blows carbon dating out of, the, out of the water because now you can't even date it because it's been underwater. So what is that proof? Well, the layers. How do you know how old this layer is near the cause of the fossil in it? Well, how do you know how old the fossils are? Because what layer they're in? It's circular reasoning. This layer of Earth is 50 million years old. How do you know? Because the fossil's in it. How do you know they're 50 million years old? Because they're in the layer where there's 50 million years. There's no proof. That chair is blue. Why? Because it's a chair. That, you know, it's because I said so. That's just ignorant choosing. There is no evidence because it's not true. And they know it. It's a deliberate fraud. To pass off on children in schools. Because they hate the Lord. They hate God and want to reject Him. And serve Lucifer. Now, let's go on. Paul lists unthankfulness as the second sin deserving God's wrath. A man that sees the work the creator of the Creator and understands that his very breath is a gift of God. My very breath is a gift of God. Yet neglects to be thankful is proud and self-willed. You mean you won't thank him for all that he's done? You won't give glory to the one who is glorious? You won't say thank you for all that you created and for giving me life? You won't. That's your second act of rebellion. You refuse to give him glory and you won't thank him. He may argue that he has received a raw deal in life. Well, I was born in a bad neighborhood and my mom died when I was five and, and then we were poor and also I hate God. Well, that, that only confirms your unthankfulness is without excuse. He has always been good to you. Everybody has had some raw deals. People say, oh, this is the cards I was dealt. It's not, it's not cards you were dealt. We live in a fallen world and some bad things happen. And people, some people have had a really bad childhood and some bad experiences. That is not God's fault. It amazes me that people say who, there is no God will blame him. And yet the one who's really responsible, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. He gets all scot free. Nobody ever says, oh, the devil made my mom sick. The devil took my mom. It's always God did it. God did not. You want to see the thief, the robber? He's the one who did it. God has always loved you. It amazes me how the devil, people, people say they don't believe God or the devil. The devil gets solved and they always blame God. Wait, how do you blame him? You don't believe in him. You just said he doesn't exist and now you said it's his fault. I don't think you even know what you believe. So they only confirm their unthankfulness is without excuse. Now, vain in their imagination. God has given us the power to imagine, as I said, and we can invent some remarkable things. But we, when we imagine the impossible, it's called a vain imagination. Men were uncomfortable with the eternal God who has power and authority, so they imagined him to be something less. They rethought God, and this is what Paul's going to work on now. Since God that we can see clearly is holy and he's loving and kind, it doesn't go along with our plan, so let's reinvent God. Let's tell all the people, this guitar is your God. It's beautiful. We made out of wood. It has beautiful music. And so we want you to pray to this guitar. And this is going to be our God now. And this guitar says, everything goes. Oh, yeah, we love the guitar God. I mean, I'm, I'm, sound, I'm being facetious, but that's really about the way it is. Let me take a piece of stone or a piece of wood and carve it into this dilapidated looking human thing. And this is our God. We're going to bow down. So they rethought God. God had illuminated the heart of everyone born into the world, as we said, John 1, 9. But the light dimmed because of their imagination over the light of truth. No, I reject that. I imagine a world where we can do whatever we want. Now... The reason things are wrong, the reason God doesn't want us doing it is because he knows how bad it is for us. Do you know that God wants the best for you? He wants the absolute best for you. He's not withholding things that are good. He's withholding danger from you. 
It's just like when you have a little child that keeps reaching up to the stove and you keep saying, don't do that. And they think, well, you're restricting me from having fun. No, when you reach up a little higher, you're going to burn your hand. And I know that and you don't. And you think I'm withholding something good. You want to run out into the street and I know you're going to get run over. So I'm withholding what's going to kill you or harm you. You just don't know that. You have to stay in the yard. I feel like a prisoner in my yard. I want to go out. Boom, hit by a car. That's why I said stay in the yard. You understand? God is doing what's best for us. And he knows and we're just, sorry, too stupid to know it. That's the truth. I hate to say that, but we're too stupid to know it. <laughs> Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They thought, we've created these guys. Now see how wise we are? And we're going to philosophize. We're going to... We're going to explain God away. And, and so what they did, looking at their creations of their own minds, they proudly thought themselves to be wise. They established universities and praised their knowledge. And they set up professors, doc, doctor of philosophy, doctor of divinity. And they called them wise, but God called them fools. Now, I'm not saying all universities are wrong or all knowledge is wrong. I'm talking about the ones that that go against scripture and come up with philosophies and things and they try to explain away or do something contrary to God, which is the majority now. Although most of our universities were established for the purpose of teaching the Bible. All our Ivy League universities and all, they were established for that, but they've been hijacked by Luciferians who want Lucifer to take over the world or they want to get Jesus out of here. So God calls them fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see, like Medusa with all these snakes coming out and all. The snakes are your God? You know why? Because here's what it is. They changed. If you change something, it means that you had an understanding because you couldn't change it. You wouldn't say you changed it if you never knew it, right? So if I'm going to change something, it's because it was something else. So they changed, meaning that they understood the glory of God, but consciously rejected the truth. They made God to be in the image of a man and bowing to human statues. Then they got tired of that. So they did images of birds and then beasts and then creeping things. They were not misguided victims of their time. They were making God into an image compatible with their lust. Because Medusa, and as we're going to see, almost all these ancient religions included sexual immorality at the temple. They had temple prostitutes, and you came there, and to invoke your God, you had sexual intercourse, illicit sexual intercourse, to make the God happy with you. This is a God they created to fulfill their lust. When men distort the image of God, they lose the only reference by which to identify themselves. Now listen to this. If you change who God is into this, he's the only reference point. You have to have a reference point in everything. Do you, you understand that? Like if you're going to measure something, you have to have a reference point. We're going to measure from this point. You can't just reach in the air randomly and say, what's the point of the measurement? You have no starting. Where's your reference if I'm going to drop somewhere, I type in the address. It says, well, where are you now? I'll tell you how many miles. I'm not going to tell you where I am, but tell me how long it's going to be. There's no reference point. How can I tell you how long it's going to get there when I don't know where you are? You understand? Where's the reference point? So when you change God, you have no reference point for identity. If we glorify God as God, then we can know man is man. But since we pushed him out, people don't have a reference point now. They don't know man is man. I identify as a jellyfish. Can you show me where the jellyfish bathroom is? I, I identify as a girl. I identify I, I identify as a doll. I mean, I'm, it sounds like I'm being facetious. They're saying now there's like 72 genders. Are you serious? There's no reference point. I identify as a tree. And you think, are these people for real? Like, I think the middle institution, I think they all got free and like, I don't know what's going on, but people are lost their minds. Seriously, they come and say, I don't know if I'm a boy or a girl. I say, the doctor's in there. Go in there, and he'll do a quick look. He'll tell you right away you're a boy or girl. It's a real fast examination. You probably have seen it. 
and he'll point it out to you if you missed it. That's a boy, and that's a girl. Are you still confused? I'm sorry. I'm not politically correct. I'm telling you, it blows my mind the things I'm hearing. And now, I was just told the other day, a thing is now is called, uh, you know, there was transsexual and this, now it's biosexual. They like to go in a room with a plant or dirt to mate with the dirt. I thought, see, see how, see when you refuse God, how you just go down into such stupidity. I mean, mind-boggling stupidity. I think you did lose your reference point. You don't even have any reference point. You're out of your mind. Anyway, I'm sorry, but this stuff just blows my mind. The more I just heard that last week, and I thought, all right, every time I think I've heard it all, I find out there's a lot more to all than I thought. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor the bodies between themselves. This is the first time God said he gave them up. So God keeps working with them, showing them who, they, who he is. They reject, they reject. God is still working. He backs up and says, you know what? That's your choice. All you want is lust. I'm just going to, the hand that's been pulling back, I'm just going to release it. I, I fought and fought, and you just want this, so I'm going to give you what you want. So he released them. The real reason for rejecting the true image of God and creating another is the indulgence of the flesh. As I said, nearly all, all ancient religions include prostitution and other immorality in their worship. God responded by releasing his hand that pulled them back. They had given him up for lust, so he gave them up to lust. They gave up God because of lust, for the purpose of lust, so he gave them up to that lust. If that's what you want, go ahead, dishonor your bodies. That's the first step. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. They knew the truth, they hold the truth, but they changed it into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Oh, body. Man, we, we're just all about body. Look at my body and look at that body and they just, everything became creature worship. Oh, body, body, everything's flesh, flesh, body, body. Forget God, he's a, he's, he don't like us to do this. He, he wants us to have this wonderful marriage relationship and all, but he, we just want to indulge. So he said, go ahead. I, I'm going to give you up. I'm not pulling back anymore. Watch what happens when God says, go ahead. Does it stop there? Lust is never satisfied. It's insatiable. In May of 1965, the Rolling Stones wrote a song, and you might remember, I do, because I was seven years old at the time. I can't get no satisfaction. And the reason they wrote it was two things. And this is according to articles. Their sexual frustration and commercialism. They were frustrated because they were having illicit sex without limits, and they said, I'm never satisfied. You know why? Because lust never satisfies. The end of lust is lust, more lust. It's insatiable, and it increases. We're going to see that. Now, they had to understand the truth of God in order to change it. Their bodies were the object of their devotion. Some attempted to worship God while including the flesh. Oh, I still know there's God, but I'm going to do the fleshly thing. But the result was that they worshipped and served each other's bodies more than the Creator. Just more flesh, more sin. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. First, He said, go ahead. You fought me and fought me on this. I'm pulling back my hand. Go ahead with your lust. Now, He said, He finds out they've been trying this thing. It's not satisfying, so now they're going to switch it up a little. They're going to try something different because I've already been lying with everything I saw, and so I'm going to switch it up a little and try something a little bit different than what we've been doing and go for same sex. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's against nature. God has put in us just like he put positive and negative attract in the magnetic field, he put this in us. It is not natural when we don't do that. It's not that I inherited this from Adam. No. Although we inherited, yes, we, we inherited a sin nature with a fallen world, 
God's healing has put natural desires into us. And so and often we think, oh, that's men, but women? He's starting off with women. Yeah, this was women doing this. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's not nature, it's against nature. God shines a light on everyone who comes into the world. They change the truth of his nature into a compatible image around which they practice their morality. He honored their choices and gave up to uncleanness, step one. Their uncleanness drew them further into lust until they worshiped their very bodies, so God gave them up the vile affection. That's the step, second step. He backs up, he strives, he strives, all right. It's just going further and further. All right, I'll give you up to it, and they're going to, they're going to go even further. And I mean, it, gets, it can get really far and go beyond this, as you probably know. People get really... They had no affection for lovely things. They loved the obscene and the vile. They pulled away, so he gave them up to their choice. Just because something feels like love doesn't mean it's holy. Affections can be vile. God designed a natural use for females and their male counterparts just like positive and negative. This is not to destroy anybody. Oh, you're a hater. Oh, get him off Facebook. He's preaching hate. I'm not preaching hate. This is the word of God. It's no hate. It's love. God is still saying, I will receive you even though you've gone to this. I would love to come into your life. I love you. I don't like what you're doing, but I love you. I'm still trying. I'm not rejecting you. You're rejecting me. I'm not the hater. You're the hater. You hate God. Sorry. See, people always try to make God the perpetrator and they're the victim. It's the opposite. God's the victim and they're the perpetrator. God's not hunting people down. Oh, you're gay. You should die. He does not. He loves the people. He loves them and wants them to be, receive him. And it's not just gay. It's not at all. And the word fornication can encompass adultery, uh, homosexuality, bestiality, encompasses a, a wide variety of immorality. So, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, seemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or which was fitting. Now, this is interesting because leaving the natural use indicates they were endowed with natural tendencies, but they left them for a lower, perverted imagination of their own lust. Now, people say, oh, don't call it perverted. Perverted just means it's not what it was intended to be. You know, if, if I take my car and, and, uh, and, and, and I use it to run over people, that's a perversion of its purpose. So don't take offense at the word. Pervert means just you're, doing it for, you're using it for a purpose it wasn't intended for, that's all. It's not calling people names. The rules can be created where none exists by throwing off the natural and exchange those perverted. All human appetites can be conditioned to enjoy what is otherwise naturally repugnant. You can condition yourself to it. The source of their drives was self-induced lust, not natural tendencies. There's no satisfaction for sinful lust. Lust is the end of lust. It escalates until it's an uncontrolled burning. Having scratched a spot that doesn't itch until it does itch. Do you hear that? Scratching a spot that doesn't itch until it does itch. That's what this is about. One can then offer what seems an acceptable excuse for further scratching, but they can and should break the addiction. Now, this is what it's saying. Do you understand what it means to scratch a spot that doesn't itch until it does itch? To feed it, to fuel it until you create a desire? And then you say, it's not my fault that I drink, I'm an alcoholic. Well, you weren't an alcoholic until you kept drinking and drinking and drinking and over drinking until you became an alcoholic. So it's still not God's fault, it's something you chose. The sins of the flesh are unseemly. It means they're, they're not appropriate, not fit to be seen. They should never be viewed on the screen or to be described in books. The burning lust is evidence of the constant supply of mental fuel beating the fire. Imaginations, looking at, reading, and then we wonder why we're overcome. And it's feeding, it's fuel. The more fuel you put in, the, the bigger it burns. A fire burns more when you give it more fuel. So putting more fuel into lust, Makes the lust burn hot. 
And then people say, I can't help it. This is the way I was born or this. No, you fed it. You scratch a spot that didn't itch until it did itch, and now you're fueling it. And that's the problem. Now, something occurs within them. And this is what we want to see. The addiction itself is the present worst retribution for substance abuse or any other abuse, lust or whatever. So when we participate in it, the addiction itself is a retribution. Because once people get addicted, they think, Hi, I'm in prison now. And this is a horrible way to live, and I can't get loose now. So see, that alone is retribution for what we deliberately chose to get into. Unnatural lust has unnatural fulfillment. The judgment was not the result of God responding. When people become addicted, to God didn't do that as a judgment. That was a natural retribution for continuing in it on purpose. Inherent in the sin, inherent means it's inborn, itself was the immediate penalty. Psychological, emotional, physical, sodomy, produce deadly diseases. And then people would turn around and say, it's not the effect of sin. I've witnessed it for sin. People that I was close to in love, people who were Sunday school teachers and others, not just teachers. One of them I had to take care of for a while. Some who came to me and even told me that what they were participating in at large numbers. I know three people in particular that I was real close to and they all died. I was thinking about this last night. I can still picture the one in the casket. It was the worst corpse I have ever seen in my life. I walked in after church on a Sunday night in a funeral home and I gasped because I thought I was at a horror show. The death that this person went through after being so totally promiscuous in these things was incredible. And I'm not saying good for you. It was heartrending. People who ate in my house and sat with me and my children and to see the horrible way they went down, it wasn't a judgment from God. That was something you participated in knowing. And you went into headlong and just kept doing it and kept doing it over years. And this is what happened. Do we hate people like that? It's not a hate. It's a love. You feel bad like your heart bleeds for that, that, that this happened. People want to make Christians haters, not haters. God is not a hater. He's a lover. It's the rejection of Christ over and over again as God pleads. Now this is what happens. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. First he backed up and said, all right, I'm going to withdraw my hand if you want to go into lust. The lust went deeper. They went into same sex. He withdrew his hand. They went deeper. And now it's got so bad. We don't even want to hear God. We don't want to hear the name Jesus. I don't want to think about him. I don't want to see him. Don't mention his name in the marketplace. Don't mention his name to me at work. I don't want to ever hear it. They did not like. It was a decision for their own affections and intellect. This shows they knew God to an extent, but made the choice to banish him from the knowledge and the mention of him. They do not even want his people around because of the light. They don't even want to be around Christians. Just the way you don't participate and you say no to things, still keeps bringing it back, and I don't want it. Atheism and agnosticism are not natural but rebellious choices. They are not. I was naturally born an atheist. No, you weren't. Every man is lightened by Christ when he enters this world, and you chose to banish God from you. Don't say you didn't know. Everybody knows. Now, a reprobate mind. This is serious. Reprobating the mind is not the cause of the sin, but the result of it. It's not because they had a reprobate mind. They knew God and glorified Him not as God. To an extent, they didn't know Him personally. This is the third and final time God responded by giving them over. The first two conditions were recoverable because the mind was still intact. This third release is into an altered mental state. Reprobate means to set aside its unfit and unstable their minds began to lose touch with reality. And don't you see it? They're, what they say and do is not even reality. You think you're, you're in another dimension or something. I can't believe they are so against God that they have an altered state of mind now. And this is the problem. For a thrill, they imagined the reality as they would like it to be until they believed their own lies. 
convincing themselves there is no God to whom we must give account, they not only cut all the wires, but they smashed the telephone. I'm cutting off. I don't want to ever hear from God. I'm cutting the wires. I don't want to hear his name. I don't want to hear Jesus. I don't want to hear about him. I don't want to hear a song about him. I'm not only cutting the wires, I'm smashing the phone. I don't ever want communication with God. I don't want him speaking to my mind or heart. I don't want him. And they're comfortable now. There's no more conviction. There's no more guilt. The struggle has ceased. They await the blackness of eternity, convinced that it all ends at a coffin. As Jude said, they are raging seas, foaming out their shame, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I refused God, and he backed up and let me go, but still strove with me. I refused him, he backed up again, and now he gave me to a reprobate mind. Without the Lord's mind, your mind is, I'm sorry, it's crazy. You are mentally unstable at that point. That's what reprobate is. You have no judgment. You have no reasoning. Now, let's go on. So being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. I'm not going to define them. We don't have time. But you could probably quickly define these and know that we all can find ourselves in this list at one time. Backbiters, behind people's back, haters of God, that's the main thing. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents is in the same list with all this. People don't realize how bad disobedient to parents is. It's a serious sin. The first commandment with promise was if you will honor, not just obey, but honor your father and mother, it'll be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. God is not kidding about honoring your parents. And it doesn't say until you're 18. You honor them your entire life. When you're 50 and you're taking care of your 75-year-old parent, you don't go in, I'm going over here like they're the kid now. They're still my dad or my mom, and you honor them, and you listen to what they say. doesn't mean they should govern all the details of your life. But you should listen to their advice, and you should show honor to them. Absolutely. Without understanding, covenant breakers, they say one thing, they don't keep it. Without natural affection. I know it's running out of time, but I'm just going to mention this. This was years ago when I was down in Alabama. <laughs> I'm sorry, help me. <laughs> this man got a good job, and he started, and I, they're close to me, this is what I'm saying. He would go out of town for a week at a time on his job, and he started doing drugs, and they would hire prostitutes to come to their room, be a group of them. He came back and divorced the woman. He had three little kids who loved him. He was in the driveway pulling out, and the neighbors were there. I'm sorry, this is... And as he's backing up, the kids are crying, Daddy, Daddy, they keep begging for him. He said, he's laughing, saying, I don't have to take care of these little SOBs anymore. And he drove away and never contacted his kids. And, at the, and, the, and the elderly man and woman who were watching said, we were crying watching those kids. And what is inside that a man can drive off while his kids are saying, Daddy, Daddy, and laugh and turn his back on them and walk away? There's something wrong. You got into the drugs and prostitution and, all, and you're totally warped now. You don't even have natural affection. Your own children are crying for you and you walk off like that. How can that be? People sink to this and they don't even have natural love or affection or anything. They're warped. Un implacable means they can't be placated. No matter how much you try to solve the problem, they can't be placated. They're just always at, uh, creating a turmoil. Unmerciful. There's no mercy in them. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they don't only do them, but they have pleasure in them that do them. These are the people I hang with. I like to be, and, and I like to watch it. I like to vicariously watch people murder people, because this is what I like, and watch people hurt people, and rape people, and all. That's what I like to watch, because that's what I enjoy. And, and, and the TV's full of it. And we, we enjoy watching somebody be killed, or raped, or raped. It's like, what's wrong? Something's wrong. They're unmerciful. No natural affection. This is a result of refusing and rejecting Jesus Christ. 
We are not a victim. We have chosen the rejection. So may God help us. You know, as I said, Romans 1, people take offense at it. It's not offense if God loves everybody. He's not hunting people down to say, I hate this group of people. He loves every group of people. It's the people rejecting him. Let's all bow our heads in prayer.